Okay. <clears throat> well, one of the, when I was modeling all this, I see somebody made the comment a while ago about labels, or maybe it was just to me personally, the different kind of labels that we put on students, and, and we do that. And one of the bad things about the diagnosis of learning disabilities is that a person takes it on as their identity. You know, I'm an ADD or so I don't have to do anything or something, or I have a learning disability so I don't have to succeed in school or something like that. And so when, when a parent brings a student to see me, and I'll say this and I hope you understand, I don't care what the diagnosis is because I want to know what their subjective experience is. And then I want to move them beyond that. What I do is teach them how to learn and teach them how to um, value school and things like this, which I'll give you a little bit of here in a little bit. But I want, I want to figure out a way to get them to the point that they can um, you know, use their mind successfully in school or in, in their job or wherever they are, regardless what the diagnosis is. Um, so I want to know, you know where did this stuff come from? You know, why are these, all these kids and all these adults that are out there that are having these symptoms? <clears throat> and here's what I found. And I want you just to recognize as we go down through this list, you know, you have the skills to help them at every, at every level. One of the first things that I found, probably the most common thing that I found is stress and anxiety. Probably, I'll bet when you heard me talking about the symptoms of ADD, I mean, some of you went, my God, I do that. Well, you probably do that when you're highly stressed or when you know, have a bunch of anxiety in your life. And I do, I go into practically every one of those symptoms. Um, and just think of you know, the pressure cooker thing that I was talking about with the, with the students, when we put pressure on them and when we criticize them, when we treat them the way we treat them, when we uh, malign them and do all sorts of things and call them names and make them feel weird, that just puts a lot of stress and anxiety on them and doesn't help the problem at all. Um, what a trauma. This, and this was surprising to me. I mean, I was just, my learning strategy is that I muddled a lot. And so the way you use NLP is you step inside the experience of somebody, the subjective experience, and go, what's going on in here? And what I started finding originally was, was uh, some trauma, but it was from the past. I mean, I would understand that if somebody was having trauma in their life right now, that that would just send them into high stress and high anxiety. I mean, I'd understand that. But what really surprised me was that some of these kids um, had medical stress, for example, that they've been traumatized by the medical profession maybe when they were two to three to four years of age. I mean, I remember the first one that I found was a little 12-year-old boy that with ADHD that came in from uh, Michigan, I think. And we were on a kind of a break, and I, I asked the mother, I said, you know, when did this start? And she said, well, we had him diagnosed when he was six, but actually he was real hyper before that. And I said, when? She said, well, back around three to four. And I said, did anything significant happen to him at that time? And she thought for a minute, and she said, well, yeah, something did. And I said, what was it? She said, <clears throat> they thought that he had asthma. And so they gave him this medicine that they weren't supposed to give to children. And <clears throat> he would just sit in the chair, and he would be totally out of control. I mean, he'd just sit there and shake like this. And he'd say, Mom, I can't think, I can't think, I can't control it. Now, what I do with something like that is that I go first person with that. I step into the experience of that and say, okay, here I am. I'm doing this. Now, what, what meaning do I attach to this? You know, what, is, what are the issues here? What's the meaning? And the meaning that I attach to it is that I'm out of control. And I started, once I heard that, because one of the things I found with ADD, I can't remember if I said this or not, is that they, they have a sense that their mind is out of control and they, cannot, they can't control it. So what happens is he was on this medicine for about nine months. And finally they took him off of it and realized they weren't supposed to give him that medicine, but you know, the imprint was already there. And so it became a self-fulfilling prophecy that that's why he was going to act out. And again, with EFT, you guys can go back to that imprint and you know, do something about that. Um, and I started searching for other uh, causes, I mean, like early trauma, like medical, and I found, I, I found a bunch of them. I just really, really blew me away. And then the more I got into it, the more I realized that we were traumatizing them in our schools. I mean, you think of the things that we do, the way we grade, um, the way we give feedback to students, um, and there's all sorts of things that happen that cause them to raise their stress and anxiety and, and traumatize them. It actually gives them in, what we call in NLP, imprint experiences. And they, the imprint experiences changes their beliefs, and you have emotional baggage tied to it, and then they start living through that. 
and it just becomes a, an event in their life that it basically affects their life for the rest of their life. Um, candida, uh, I'm sure everybody knows what candida is, but you can have these symptoms of, of um, ADD if you have candida. Candida is where you have the, um, the yeast um, disease, if you want to call it that. They used to think that only women had it, but I've had it. And when I had it, for example, I couldn't think. The time that I have it, I'd be up giving a workshop or a speech or something, and, and it's just like I'd just lose it. You know, and I wasn't that old back then, but it's just like the, I'd stop in the middle of the sentence and wouldn't have any idea what I was saying. My son had it when he was in college, and he couldn't go to sleep at night because it got into his neurology and it got into my neurology. And if it gets into the neurology, then it can create the symptoms of ADD. And to go to a good health food store or to eat right, change your diet, and do stuff like that. And to do some tapping on it will make that go away. Um, <clears throat> attitude. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on, but our schools, bless their heart, never get around to teaching children how to learn in the classroom, how to learn the academic subjects. We have this major presupposition that our schools operate out of as a corporate body that students already know how to learn in the classroom and from books and things like that, and therefore we don't have to teach them how to learn. So we give these ac academic tasks to the kids. We say, do it. If they say, I don't know how, how do I do this? We point a finger at them and say, don't be such a troublemaker. Um, you know, and we criticize them for doing that, which just creates more stress. But one of the things that I found that was the most traumatizing was the fact that we would give them these assignments to do and they wouldn't know how to do them. They would do the best they could. They would create some learning strategy or something to just to see if it would work. And if they got any kind of help at all with it, then they'd just keep going back to the well and do it over and over again until it became their way of doing things. Simple little things like learning how to spell, how to learn your math facts, how to, how to learn facts and how to memorize. I mean, the, the learning strategies that most students try to do with those basic survival skills is just inefficient and ineffective. It just doesn't work at all. I mean, as an example, you know, you you give somebody ten spelling words and and they learn them. And so you might say, well, write them down ten times or fifteen times or something like this. That's a learning activity. You don't know what happens in the brain. So what I did, one of the major things I did was realize that that was one of the things that was happening to our students and started using NLP to go out and model out, you know, what are effective learning strategies that are world class? I mean, what, what can a student do so that they can, in one week, I can turn a student around to make an A's. We may, they're making D's and F's on spelling tests, and in one week they'll go to making a hundreds or making A's, just because they now have, they have a way to do it that works really well. So the five basic, uh, sort of what I call survival strategies, are how to learn spelling words, how to learn math facts, how to memorize data, because that's basically what their academic life is like. And then how to learn vocabulary, how to learn terminology. I mean, that is such a major, major vacuum in, uh, in the lives of students. The ways that they attempt to do that are so bad that it's really the, the number one reason why they can't read and comprehend what they read, because they don't have a, ter they don't have a good way to learn terminology. And then the other major uh, strategy is our schools don't get around to teaching reading comprehension. I mean, I, I kept finding this, and I finally called a reading coordinator. I used to be on the school board, and I called the reading coordinator of the school and said, I, I can't remember how I learned, how I was taught how to read and remember what I read. What, what do we do to read teaching com, reading comprehension? And she just kind of, there was one of these long pregnant pauses, you know. And she said, well, actually, we don't teach reading comprehension. We just assume it's going to be there, we assume it's going to work. But well, if you don't know how to read and comprehend something, how, how are you going to do well in school? And so we put pressure on them, which raises the stress and anxiety. Then we start criticizing them because they're not doing well. And you know what? This starts occurring about the fourth grade. In the first three grades, for most schools, you are learning to read, learning how to sound out the words. Fourth grade, they give you the science book, the sociology book, and said, now read this and learn. So you go from learning to read to reading to learn, and we don't give them a way to do it, right? So about fourth grade is where a lot of this trauma starts hitting. Now, they can have other trauma before that, but at fourth grade, it's practically universal. I say fourth to fifth grade because it 
kind of slow catch it on to some students, they start having trauma and start building up a lot of the symptoms of ADD and just uh, being students that have trouble. So going in and teaching them how to learn, teaching them how to value school, teaching them how to think about school in a way that turns the motor on, uh, kind of a lot of times turns, or, turns the, um, the symptoms of ADD around because they don't have the stress and anxiety that, that goes with, I don't know how to do it anymore. So I think EFT is just really good to get rid of that emotional baggage and change a, a tremendous amount of what's going on inside of them. But they, if, if you do that and you don't teach them how to learn, they'll re-traumatize themselves because they still don't know how to do what's being expected of them to do. Um, <clears throat> the communication gap that I talked about, there's a VK loop. And if um, both the, our, all, most of our schools are highly auditory, um, most of the communication that comes from parents is highly auditory. Not all of it, but most of it is. And so whenever they start getting in trouble because they're not, you know, not paying attention, they're forgetting things, they're not communicating, <clears throat> then it goes back to the stress and anxiety, which causes the symptoms of ADD to come up again. And that's a pretty simple one to teach, uh, not only uh, teach parents and teachers to you know, become more visual or become more kinesthetic with their communication, but you could also teach the ADD students. You can, take, you can take the resistance and the rebellion away from them with tapping and then teach them what it's like to make their own pictures so that when somebody's talking to them, they overlap it and they make visual um, images that's redundant. They make images in their mind of a meaning of what the parents are telling them to do. And it solves that problem. And then the last one is the physical reaction. Uh, we've been talking about toxins and allergies and, and uh, junk food and sweet and uh, sugar and all those types of things. And that will cause the symptoms of ADD too. And you guys are well equipped to take care of that. Um, in fact, I'd, I'd say i probably check out attitude first, but almost immediately, I, I, in the meantime, almost simultaneously, I'll be asking the parent about diet and stuff that's going on in the, in the child because that can occur. Any questions about that? About what I consider, I'm not, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm an educator. And, but with NLP, this is what I found. The, uh, t the basic skills that you talked about teaching, um, do you, are those in your book or how, yes. are those written down somewhere how to do, how to do that? Yes, the, my book has three major sections. It's um, first section is tips for students and it's learning strategies, you know, how to, how to, how to visualize. I want them to become visual learners um, at which fits these, these kids that have all these pictures flying around. Um, I teach them, here's a spelling strategy and I've taken all the fluff out of it. It's like, it's a handbook. Step one, step two, step three, step four. And then all the, most of the major learning strategies that I've found and developed, um, they're in that first section. The middle section is tips for parents and teachers. And it's a lot about how this communication gap, how to get rapport, um, how to turn kids on to school, how to affect the ad attitude, how to shift their limiting beliefs and things like that. And then the last section is on ADD and learning disabilities. So. Is there tapping in the book? Do I? Do you talk about tapping in the book? I didn't know tapping when I wrote that book, so I'll have to do a sequel to it, <laughs> include EFT. Second book. Yeah, second book. I got one on the, on the way. Have you found any connection between uh, vaccinations and ADD? Vaccinations? Yeah, childhood vaccinations. Oh, I would imagine that goes right into that trauma slot right there. I don't... I don't know that I have a specific memory of something, but I would certainly, you know, every time I watch on, on news or something, they're holding the baby down and giving them a shot, you know, I go, how traumatic could that be? <laughs> you know? Yes. Can you give more of a, a map of what you do exactly when somebody comes into you, like is what the first session would be, second session and all that? You know, like, do you have a questionnaire? Are you, are you getting right down to work with the child right away? And do you just go through this list and... How I, exactly would you do sure. it? Sure. I <clears throat> understand I've only been doing EFT for about two to three years, so this is still coming into my, my realm. Uh, basically, what I do is um, do an assessment. It takes about an hour. They come in, and, and I, I do an assessment of what are their learning strategies, what's their attitude, and I'm going to show you more about that here in a minute. Um, I can tell a parent, tell a student within an hour if I can help them. You know, does the student have good learning strategies or not? You know, do they have... Do they have trauma? Do they have emotional baggage, et cetera? 
And then if they want the program, I have a flat rate fee. It takes about six to eight sessions for me to, to totally transform a student's life. And I'm working on the student from word go on, on um, attitude, on learning strategies, and if I find an emotional thing that's happening, then I will tap on it. Um, if um, if a hyperact in the meet while I'm teaching them maybe the learning strategies, if hyperactivity, the, any of the ADD symptoms start getting in the way, I tap on those just to get them out of there. So I, I take as my, my basic framework, I'm going to teach them how to learn because, again, if, if they leave me without knowing how to learn, then they're just going to re-traumatize themselves again. The prevailing question that I have while I work through all the issues that come up and stuff like that is, is there anything in school that you have trouble doing? Is there anything in school that you don't like to do? Is there anything in school that you're slower than the other kids? You know, is there anything that you, you, um, that you just basically can't do? And then I go in and I teach them how to do those things or do whatever I need to do to relieve that. When they can't come up with anything else, then they're through, basically. And that's, that's how I know when I'm through. So it may be six to eight sessions, but it's, um, I, if it takes more than that, it takes more than that. It's a, I don't give a money back guarantee, but I guarantee that I will get them to that point. So Now, I want to shift you after this next question <laughs> to a, a different model um, to give you a way to think about how you can uncover aspects that um, to give you a perceptual template, if you will, for how to think about a student or how to think about somebody uh, to uncover the aspects that, that you need to work with. So, yes. Um, I, I was just wondering if it's the same protocol for an adult with ADD as it, as it is with the child, like the six to eight sessions. Um, yes, it is. I, what I do works the same at whatever age level I have. I've had grandparents, I've had graduate students, I've had adults in business, I've had all the way down to kindergarten, although that, that's a little young. Most times it's about third grade and, and up that come to see me, but it works with all of them. Yeah. Also, do you do it on the phone? I haven't tried that yet because um, <clears throat> there's a lot of, when I'm teaching them how to learn, there's a lot of stuff that I want them to see. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, don't, I, haven't, I have not thought about doing that on the phone. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just one question. I just want to ask if this is what you're saying. Are you saying that, that basically, according to your experience, ADD has its basic root in early stress as a child? Uh, that's what I'm finding. And I, you know, that, I know that doesn't fit with a lot of the um, medical profession. There's a lot of people that think it's genetic. There's a lot of people that think, you know, the medical profession people probably think there's some medical or neurological reason that it's that way. Um, but what I do is go with what can I do. And what I found was that in every one of them, they had, they had the um, trauma. Uh, they have high stress when, whenever they're showing these symptoms up. And so I deal with what I need to deal with. This way I do it. Okay. Well, I don't know what it's like in Oklahoma, but in New Mexico, I know that fourth grade, which is when you said it sort of levels out to, a, to all kids having that stress, that's when state testing begins for our students. Well, that's a good way to traumatize them. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I, can I ask a quick question before sure. you go on to that? Because uh, I was going to ask it earlier. Do you, can, can you comment on, is ADD on the rise as the, per, as the perception is, or is it kind of like what we were talking about with sex abuse last night is just that it's becoming more publicly discussed and, and, and known about. What's your, what's your hit on that? It's my impression that <clears throat> ADD and, and dyslexia are the vast dumping grounds for students that can't keep up or are having trouble in school. And so we put a label on them and throw them into this, you know, learning LD classes and stuff like that. And, um, and it's, it's my opinion, my, exp my experience, that yes, it is, the diagnosis of it is growing, is getting bigger and bigger. And, of course, there's a whole bunch of controversy out there. There's a growing debate about Ritalin, um, about whether or not we should be using it or not, and that it being, there's been books written about it being over-prescribed and things like that. You know, there's a black market for Ritalin, so that the kid takes the Ritalin to school, and the, before he can turn it over to the school nurse, uh, the other kids are buying it off of him or, or taking it off of him by force because it's speed, you know, and they, they like the effect that it has. And so there's, I mean, there's a... A lot of articles that come out about the effect of Ritalin and the overuse of it, the overdiagnosis, and but yeah, it's a, I think it is, um, but that's just my opinion. I'm, I'm not.
quote unquote an expert, you know, medical doctor or something like this, but it seems to me as though it is on the rise. And, and what I read in the papers and magazines and stuff like this is that it seems to be on the rise. Yeah. And <clears throat> there's, we could go in a whole different direction, but a lot of times I get asked, is TV a cause for this? And um, I really believe that it is for the right, for the in increase in it. Because TV, television. I mean, think about the, think about, think about the difference in the, not, I'm not talking about the violent nature of the, the, pro, the programs. I mean, that's another issue. Think about the difference in the way they do ads now. They're fast, they're moving, all these different pictures coming around. That's, that's different ads than what you and I grew up on. Um, and the ADD kids can probably st keep up with that better than we can because they can do multiple faceted things. You know, they, they know how to, to work at several different levels at the same time. In fact, I was telling somebody at break, I have this one article that somebody sent me that says ADD, kids with ADD symptoms have this um, special gift. And, you know, one of these days they will take over the world because they will be the only ones that can process information and in the multiple faceted way that we need in order to be able to, um, you know, to handle everything that's out there in the world. But we got to get them through the system first, you know, and get them, teach them a way to, to survive the system and thrive in the system in a way. This is, this is um, what in NLP we refer to as the logical levels of experience. This is um, a major, major point that I want to make with, with you guys. Um, let me explain it a little bit um, before I start applying it to what we're talking about. Just let me explain logical levels of experience. And I'm going to start down here at the bottom. Uh, this is how we experience the world. And so one of the things that you will do with this later on is that you will use this as a template. Or let's, let's put this. What I do with this is that when a student comes in to see me, I put this logical level template over their conversation with me in order to find out at what level is the issue. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's a, it, it gives me a precise way to be able to go in and say, aha, I know exactly where I need to tap or I know exactly what I need to do with them because I found out where the main, main issue is. It's in the, it's in the handout, too, if you want to. Should, should be in, in the last part of the... A new definition of ADD would be... It's also in the first article. Okay. Last few pages. <clears throat> but just, just go ahead. And, you don't have to read it. Just listen to me. <laughs> at, the, at the lowest level <clears throat> is the environment level. The environment level is the simplest level. It is the level of, about where, when, and with whom um, are you operating. Do you have, it's your physical constraints. So right now, for example, you're in Flagstaff, you're at the, this hotel, you're in this particular room, whatever the name of it is, you're with other people that are interested in, in energy, and um, you're here from whatever the dates are, whatever the times are. And that's a fairly simple type of thing. Now, a lot of times we can make changes at the environment level and really have an effect. You know, a lot of times I'll have parents call and say, my, um, my son is having trouble with the teacher. I think I'll change schools, or I think I'll change teachers. That's an, envir that's an environmental um, change. It's a simple type of thing, too. And it doesn't always work. Above that is the behavior level. The behavior level is what actions or what behaviors do I engage in in this environment? So right now, most of you are sitting there, and you are... Um, some of you are taking notes. Some of you are, look like you're thinking about what I'm saying. Some of you are listening, but you're, some of you are squirming in your seat, but some of you are very still. What I'm doing is standing up there waving my arms and talking a lot. Um, at the capability level, by the way, we also make changes um, in people at the behavior level. Like a lot of students, may, maybe you have a student with a, a score card that is... Um, you know, not too good, and so they'll say, well, you know, we're, you've been doing it at the dining room table, your homework, so we're going to shift you to your room. And you've been doing it for an hour every night, and now you're going to have to do it for two hours every night. And so we are um, 
we're shifting where in the environment they're doing it, but we're also telling them they're going to have to do their homework in a different way. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. Above that is the capability level. The capability level is what mental cognitive strategies do you use in order to do these behaviors in this environment. Now, this, I didn't know logical levels when I first started working with students, but there's a vacuum here in our schools. We do not teach them how to learn. We give them learning activities. We buy them books and we build them facilities and we give them a computer and things like this, but we do not, we do not teach them how their mind works and how to work, and that's what creates that stress and, and trauma. So that's why it's so very important in my model of what to do is that we also have to be careful besides the emotional issues that we can clear up, we have to fill this void. We have to teach them how to do what it is we're asking them to do at the mental level. It's a major, major catastrophe that we're not doing that with our kids. Above that are the beliefs and the values level. This is the why you do what you do. This is the motivational thing. This is your, where your criteria are, your standards. So <clears throat> one of the other vacuums that we have in our schools is that we do not teach schools how to value learning, how to value school, how to value good teachers, how to value doing homework, how to value math, how to value English. We just kind of leave it up to them, and we hope that they'll do it or not do it. And most of them, you ask a student, you know, what is it about school that turns you on? They go, nothing. You know, why are you here? Well, I don't know. My parents make me come. You know, and so there's, again, a vacuum there. And if we in the educational profession and, and don't come up with, you know, here is, here, is a, here is a way to think about school that turns your motor on. Here's a way to think about school that allows you to give it meaning so that it will mean something to you in a positive way. If they don't have that there, then what happens is that it's like taking the, <clears throat> me, me taking a jigsaw puzzle putting it out on the table, dumping the contents out on the table, scrambling all the pieces, but then doing this strange thing. I want to turn the pieces face down, and I'm going to take the box with the picture on it, and I'm going to stick it under the table, and I'm going to tell you, put it together. Now, a very difficult task, right? You wouldn't have any clue how the pieces came together. Well, that's what goes on with kids whenever they don't have a way to think about school or to think about math or to think about the different subjects. If you don't have a way to think about something so that, it, so that you know how your mind, you can instruct your mind to organize it, then your mind goes into this, this funk. And it's going, why am I taking this? You know, I don't know why I'm learning, learning this. And so to give them a way to think about it in a way that empowers them, it is empowering. It gives meaning to what they're doing. So um, another major void there. Um, by the way, one of the things that I do in, in that, that article in your handout on beliefs with, with um, EFT and NLP is I'm operating at this level at that with, with EFT. I, I have the belief, and I think I've been watching Gary do it, and I think I've been watching other people up here doing it, that you guys already do some of this. I know Gary goes after beliefs. I know he changes beliefs. And I think you can also install um, new empowering beliefs in people and replace the limiting beliefs that they already have. Um, above that is the identity level. The Don, ident sorry, could I ask a question about sure, that I'm level sorry, before you move on to the next one? Mm -hmm. um, and this is my own stuff, obviously, but when I was in high school, you know, you took algebra, trigonometry, all that stuff, and I never actually did have a use for it. So sometimes when I tutor kids, they ask me, well, what am I ever going to use this for? And I can tell them, you know, you're in this game that you got to play. You've got SATs coming up. Um, <laughs> but I can't always think of, I think of applications for certain friends I know who went into certain professions, but I don't always have a good answer for that, honestly. I don't know why I need to know about cosines and, you know what I mean? I, I have that yeah. limiting belief myself, and they have to spend an inordinate amount of time with this. And, you know, I was told when I was in school, it's mental exercise. That's, oh, that's what I good. was told. That'll turn your motor on. Yeah, it really thrilled me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just find that I, I don't know that I can be congruent with getting people turned on about trigonometry and calculus when, to me, in my own life, I really have done just fine without it. Fi I taught fifth grade. Well, what fifth I'd... grade math has gotten me through my life really well. 
what I would do, see, is tap on your, the fact that you had that bad experience, and then I'd turn around and teach you how to do it. There is a way to do it. There is a way to teach them that, and there is a way to turn them on. And there is a way to explain math in a way that makes sense, that gives it meaning. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how many adults I've had. I've had graduate students <clears throat> come to me, and, and they can't pass. I had this one graduate student. I'll talk about her specifically. She was trying to, um, to get her uh, Master's of Business Administration, and she had to take this test that had a math portion on it with statistics or something like that. She couldn't pass it. She, I think she flunked it two or three times. And so she said, I've never been good at math. I don't understand it. I don't want to take it. You know, I took that MBA, and I didn't know that I had to take all that stuff. And so <clears throat> I said, well, this is what I think is going on. You know, nobody ever explained to her what math was the study of. And so she came in to see me, and so I took away all the baggage that she had and, you know, cleared all that stuff out. And I said, now, let me tell you what math is the study of. And then let me give you a, a math strategy for how to learn math. And when I got through with her, within an hour, by the way, she went, nobody has ever explained it to me like that. Where were, all, where were you when I needed you? you know, and that happens a lot because when you know that you need to fill this void here and you've come up with a strategy for how to do it, basically it turns into a two-fold deal. They've, they've got emotional baggage that they've had because they've, they've been traumatized in the past. You clear that out, but then you go right in come up with you know, strategies or how to value it or whatever you need to, what they need to be able to thrive in that environment. And you can either tap that in or just teach it to them. So is that in your book? Am I going to find out why? Yes, it it's is. A, okay. It's there. I'm still wondering why. Why is it important? Well, I would tell you, but I don't have time to tell you everything. Okay, I understand. So. Thank you. Okay. Yes? I was just going to say I recently read in the paper that a very large school district somewhere, I'm not sure where, decided that math was the key, algebra was the key for helping kids to be able to get into college. And so they started teaching algebra in, you know, earlier than they ever had and emphasizing it. And so that's one answer is, hey, you may never use math in your work, but if you want to get into college, <laughs> you need to tackle it. And, and does that really turn them on too? Yeah. Well, it's, that's reality. That's a, see, that's not a big turn on either. What you want when you, <clears throat> excuse me. What you want to do when you, when you turn somebody on to school, usually you're trying to turn them on to like doing their homework or something like that, right? And the way you turn them on is that you attach the, you find out what some of their criteria are at this level, what's important to them, and then you, you attach show this, how this is going to satisfy their criteria. As soon as you make that connection between the two, their motor turns on. You wouldn't believe the number of uh, student athletes that I have. They're highly motivated on the playing field, walk into a classroom, and they go brain dead, right? Because they, they, they change their learning strategies and things like that. Once I go over here to, um, to school, and I have a way that I've developed that's in my book on how to elicit what their criteria are, and you elicit their criteria for doing sports well, then you just transfer it right back over into math or school and say, this is how to make school meaningful to you. And it works just like that. It's, somebody said this, I don't know if it was last night or, or when, everybody's running together now. I'm, I'm not teaching them anything, basically. I am bringing resources from one area to another area that they don't have those resources. Is the way I think about what I do. Um, <clears throat> I'm not changing anybody, I'm just relieving some of the emotional baggage that they have, giving them a chance, if you will to learn something in a way that is world class. One more question, real and then quickly. I need to move on. Yeah, real quickly, uh, <coughs> it seems, well, just my, my own gut says that this has been a universal experience. I know it has been for me. Uh, I still don't understand calculus. I still don't understand trigonometry. I don't care. I haven't used it in the last 50 years. I don't expect to use it in the next 50. Right. So, but I think that's true of almost everybody that attended high school. And what I'm trying to find out is, can you give us an example? I understand you don't have enough time to go through all the explanation, but can you give us an example of how you can make that palatable to a child? What can I do to, to, to teach a child that this is going to be palatable? Besides telling them that it's a cop commandment uh, thing, that they're going to be getting into college better so they can learn a higher form of useless, useless information. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, again, I, I find out what their criteria are, what their standards are, and, and there's, a whole, there's a whole system that I, I can't go into here about how I do that, and a lot of it is in the language pattern. We talked about NLP, about being you know, modeling technology, but 
the beautiful thing about NLP is the language that you learn. Um, I've been modeling uh, Gary while he's up here doing tapping on people, you know, and I would love to share with you what I found out about him and why his, why his tapping works so well. I may share just a little bit with him. But <laughs> in, <laughs> um, about math? Would it, would it not suffice to say it's in my book, or you can go to my website, and I think, and find it there? Um, because I really need to move on. Okay. Or come up and ask me on a break or something. I'll be happy to share with you that, if that's okay. Okay. So we are at beliefs and value level. Above that is the identity level, who I am. This is where self-esteem, self-concept comes in. Somebody with ADD, for example, see, has issues at all of these levels. In the, in the books, most of these symptoms are at the behavior level. The environment, a lot of times, like the schoolroom or maybe a hectic time at home is what triggers a lot of the deal. But they, don't, they, they feel as though they can't learn, so they have problems here, too. They believe, after a while, that they can't learn. They believe that school is a mess. They believe that school is boring, and so they have problems here, too. Then they start believing that they're, they're weird or that they... Uh, something's wrong with them, which means they've taken it right to the identity level. So they have a belief at the identity level that says, I'm different, I'm weird, I'm unusual, nobody likes me, things like that, I don't belong. And those are all beliefs at this level. And then the level above that is what we call the spiritual level or the greater system level. We all, we all belong to greater systems. We, we belong to a family, we belong to a school or an organization, we belong to a business, or we belong to... A, a state or in a nation or a universe. And this is about who else are we serving with what we do? What does what you do, who does what you do serve besides yourself? And if you can plug that into a higher vision, which is up here, higher mission in your life to serve other people, what somebody you're talking about, then it kind of ties everything together. And it gives you, it gives meaning to what you do that's outside of who you are, which is a greater meaning to have. Okay? Now, let me, let me make it. We have 30 minutes left. Can you hold out? Yes. Okay. If you, need, if you need to, just feel free to get up and <laughs> move around or stand up or go do your thing or whatever. <laughs> now... <clears throat> What, um, what Gary does, one of the things that Gary does whenever he's tapping on people is that he'll sit there, you know, his, his um, what would you call that chain of things that he says? There ought to be a word for that. Stream of, Stream of consciousness. That's one way to say it. That he's sitting there tapping on. If you'll sit there and watch it, he is, he is sitting there um, given things through the logical levels. I don't know if he knows he's doing this or not, but he'll, he'll come up with something and maybe at the capability, you know, even though I don't know how to do this, blah, 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 and, and, and then, it, then he'll go in, and he will actually, when he starts the tapping up here, he'll do the, he'll, he'll do the, on the even though stuff, when he's doing this or doing this, he's actually pacing the problem. And then a lot of times when he goes to the, the tapping, he's actually going up to, to, Sometimes the, the negative or the limiting beliefs that may be here or issues that may be here. And then sometimes he throws in a, 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 a positive one when he's doing that. Which, in my experience, what happens is that if, you're, if you clear out like a limiting belief, and we can have beliefs at all of these things, but if you clear out a limiting belief, the mind is like a vacuum. Because if you change a belief here, all of this changes. If you change a belief down here, then you still got limiting beliefs above that are going to make them come back because the, the, these control the ones that are below. So if you clear it out, um, let's say, for example, let's, let's just give, me, give you an example. Let's suppose that I have recognized that a, a student um, does not know how to learn. And, so, and they're real frustrated by it. You know, they're just totally frustrated by the school system. They, they don't like to do home. They don't like to do anything. So one of the things that I, I do is I go in and I clear out that frustration or clear out that, that old feeling of overwhelmed or confused or whatever it is. Then I will start saying things to them like this. You know, the reason 
that you've been having trouble in school. It's because nobody has ever got around to teaching you how to learn in school in a way that works really well. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that in such a way that you can learn to value school so that it means something to you, it can be of value to you, that you can believe in yourself and believe in the worthwhileness of school so that you can be the kind of student that you were meant to be, that you were born to be, the kind of student that you probably at the unconscious level always wanted to be, so that you can serve your family and your peers, maybe even help your peers because they don't know how to learn either. And so I will sit there and I will talk to them up and down the logical levels and what that's done is installing in them if you will, new ways to think about school, new ways to think about homework, new ways to think about themselves through all the logical levels, which is, a, which is a complete transformation. Because when you do partial things, like maybe you, you work on a behavior down here, they still got stuff up here that, that they'll have to come back to you for. So in, in some of the sessions we've had, we've talked about you know, people coming back or not. Uh, in my experience, if you can assist them in changing their beliefs at all these levels, then you've just, you've just transformed their lives and they have become, they, they now are in charge of their own experience because they have everything they need. They know how to do what it is that they need to do. They know how to value it, think about it. They're a different kind of person now and they know who it serves outside of themselves. It, it is a... It is a transforming experience. Now, I'm, I've never tried this, but I just had an idea. If while I'm doing this, this talk that I did, and you know, now you, that, I'm going to teach you how to learn so that you, know, you be confident in the fact that you can learn, and now you learn how to value. If we were tapping on them while, we, while I was running them up and down that, I think it would work, and I think that's what Gary does. I don't know if he consciously has this guide, but I would suggest to you I know you guys are exceptionally intuitive, but I'd suggest to you that this is a way that you can either say, keep track of where you're going, or you can um, you know, use your intuitiveness and then come back and check and say, okay, did I miss any level? And then go in there and, and work on those particular levels that you might have missed. Does this make any sense, by the way? Okay. Um, okay, I'm ready for questions now. Yes? Just a comment. As a corporate trainer, uh, being NLP based, design human engineering and human performance engineering based. Our basic concept in, in doing this, where we shoot first is the higher levels mm -hmm. since they control everything below it. Right. You won't be changing many beliefs if you change, the, if, you, if, you're a, if you're attacking the identity of level, then the beliefs, values, the capabilities, behaviors, environment all change. That's right. So it's a lot quicker and, and that's one of the values of EFT because if you're going up the if you'll notice when the cognitive change takes place, when they finally understand that they deeply and completely accept themselves, which is where? Identity, okay? Everything below that falls into line. Yeah, uh, you're, even though I have these problems, I totally, deeply, and completely accept myself, it takes it right to this level. It's one of the reasons, in my humble opinion, that that reversal works so well is that you're taking everything down here and saying, this doesn't really matter because I'm okay, right here. How does dyslexia figure into ADD? Or would you change your method of modality if you're dealing with a child or an adult who is both dyslexic and then manifests ADD as well? Um, to me, they're two different horses. Um, they are. Yeah. And to me, they, they're, again, both major dumping grounds for students that they're having trouble with. And so I know. We just kind of, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> so we just kind of put a label on them. And once we have a label, we can get federal funding and all sorts of stuff, you know. I've actually had people that ref at schools and parents that refuse to, um, to allow their, their sons to take my, my training because they know that they will not be able to get funds for them anymore. It's really a major catastrophe, but yes. So do you use kind of this to do your assessment off of too? Yes, I Basically do. You, get, you go through that and identify all these areas with the child, and then you can go back and switch those around with them. Right. Okay. Yeah, and so the way, the way that I operate basically is I, when they come in for the assessment, I am 
saying, well, you know, tell me what your school experience is like. And when they're telling me what it's like, I have the parent there. For anybody that's high school or below, I always require a parent, at least one parent to be there. And so I get two different perspectives on what's going on from both the child and from the parent. Sometimes I don't get much from the child. Um, it lets me see the dynamics that goes on between the, the two parents. Um, and then I, once, I, once I hear some of it, usually it's already come out that, well, they don't like school, or, which is at this level, or they think they're not any good, they're not a good student at this level, or um, you know, they're just not doing well in school at all. And so then I start giving them tasks to do. And the very first thing that I do is start them off with a spelling word. I want to know, first thing I want to know is can they visualize? Because in my opinion, our learning stylists uh, have it wrong. Um, you cannot survive school being a kinesthetic learner, in my opinion. You cannot survive school, or you can survive school. I'm sorry, you can survive, you cannot thrive. And you will get, it will you'll struggle in school if you're a kinesthetic learner, which means if you have to have hands-on. The academic subjects just are not suited for hands-on stuff. You, you can't, you have trouble in school and you work harder than anybody else if you're an auditory learner. An auditory learner is somebody that likes to repeat things over and over again or likes to discuss things. You know, a spelling word will be, you know, like um, school, S-C-H-O-O-L, school, S-C-H-O-O-L. Uh, they'll just say it over and over again. That's auditory learning. Um, what I found, and, and I, used, I used to go around and teach teachers how to figure out if somebody was a visual or an auditory or kinesthetic. And what I found just by muddling through and the students that would come into my office was I'll always have this question. If they say they're having trouble reading, I say, well, is there anything that they read and they enjoy? And usually there is something, even if it's a skateboarding magazine or something like that. I say, bring a skateboarding magazine and bring their history book or whatever they're having trouble reading. And then I will take the student, give them the, the history book, let's say, and say, read this for me. And within 15 seconds, I can tell you, using NLP, I can tell you what their reading strategy is, what they attempt to do to take the words off the printed page, get them inside, and if, they, if it's successful or not. And then I hand them the skateboarding magazine and say, read this article, and ask them if they've read it before, and if they haven't, I say, read this, and they read it differently. And again, I can elicit that reading strategy within just a few seconds. And basically what I do is then talk to, and what they do with the skateboarding magazine is they read it visually. What they do with the science or the history book is that they just sound the words out and nothing sticks in here, which goes to a lot of terminology. But that's what they were taught to do. Prior to the fourth grade, they were taught to sound out words. They weren't taught that now that you know how to sound the words out, here's what to do with those words when they hit your brain. And that's what I teach them how to do. Okay. Um, so, so I should, I should uh, phonically voice, spell so phonics, right? I'm sorry? Yeah, I right. Should, you can't. I should phonically spell phonics, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't spell all the words in the English language according to how they sound. Yeah, you can only spell all the words in the English language according to how they look. So if you don't teach them how to visualize, then you, you're going to have to teach them a system that's just really hard and messy and stuff like that. Like it has a lot of rules, like I before E except after C, things like that. Right. I've always thought it really funny that, that we can't spell uh, phonics phonically. You know. <laughs> it's because it doesn't look like it sounds right. is the reason. <laughs> what I wanted to, to mention earlier was someone made a statement which is a societal programmed belief. And what they stated was they took a capability and said it was their identity. I am dyslexic is not true. That's, that's exactly right. So therefore, there's something to work on right there. That's exactly right. And that's what, that's what I, one of the reasons I don't like labels like ADD and dyslexic is because that's what a student will do, is that they'll take what they're doing down here and they take it right to this level right here. When it goes to this level right here, it's a lot harder to solve, a lot harder to deal with. This is also what happens, by the way, when you have a, a kid that's having trouble in school and the parents start getting on to him, the par and the parents may be very well-intentioned or the teacher may be very well-intentioned that they're trying to help the kid do better on the next test. But what the kid will do is that they'll take this feedback, which we need, by the way, to be able to correct ourselves and learn and develop and stuff like that. They'll take that feedback and go right up here and say, what's wrong with me that he's talking to me that way? 
and they take it up here and make an identity issue out of it. So that's why I'm, I've done a lot of work with what is a better feedback model that we can work with so that those kids don't do that or that they, we, can, we have a way to help them build their self-esteem rather than tear it down. I see, he was up uh, a long time ago. Don, I, I was a little late getting here, but I've got some adult clients who've really benefited from Ritalin, and you seem to be saying that uh, you don't really see a place for medication. I, I'm with you with children. I, I like what you're doing. It makes a whole lot of sense to me. But what about adults? Well, there are, there are people out there that, um, that thrive with Ritalin. So if I said, if I said that's, not, I don't, that's not so. Okay. Um, right. And if that's what it, you know, what I say is that, man, if it works for you, and if you like to take drugs, go for it. And, and I hope you will comment a little more about adult ADD and your, and your treatment of it. That, that's what I'm primarily, uh, that, would, that would help me the most right now. So before we're done, if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. I, I work, okay, I'll say that right now. Because what I do with adults is exactly the same thing that I do with kids. I mean, there's not Well, any, we're not talking about school, and we're not talking about... Uh, Learning but, subjects in math and trigonometry right. and things. I guess I'm having a trouble. Maybe I'm dyslexic. Okay. But let me let me ask this question. No. Um, if they come to see me because they think they're ADD or they're having trouble, then that means that somebody is laying a trip on them somewhere. Oh, of you know? course. So no. my question is, what is it that this is causing you difficulty with? So if it's learning at work, or if it's um, doing the task at work or something like this, then. That's what I teach them how to do, or figure out where, what I need to teach them how to do, and then work with their beliefs around that. So, so it's like what's happening in their life that's causing them trouble. Is, is, teaching them how to learn, for example, that would be a whole different thing than you have in your book, I'm sure. Say that again? Teaching, uh, teaching children how to learn in school is a lot different from teaching adults how to, how to learn at an adult level when they're trying to overcome ADD, is it not? No. It's, it's learning strategies. Okay. okay. Um, and that's in your book too. Yeah, I'm, I don't. I don't even think uh, age level when I work okay. with somebody. <laughs> right. I just it doesn't process that way with me. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. Uh, when you were speaking about visualizing in reading, were you talking about visualizing the printed word or the object that the word describes, the okay. action as such? Good question. Did Did y'all hear it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want them to visualize the word. There are people out there that can do this. You know, they have a printed page inside their mind. I don't want them to do that because that's not what learning is supposed to be about. Learning is supposed to be about having experiences. Having experiences at the subjective experience level like visual um, images or sounds and feelings and smells and tastes and things like that. And what happens, the reason a lot of people have trouble in school with reading is because the way they learn new terminology or vocabulary. The number one way that people try, attempt to learn vocabulary words or definitions is that they'll say the word and they'll repeat the definition. They'll say the word and read the definition, say the word, repeat the definition over and over again. Is this auditory or is this auditory? And is there any subjective experience attached to this? Are there any images attached to it? Are there any sounds attached, attached to it? Are there any feelings attached to it? No, it's just a pile of words. So I, I found this, and I found that after the fourth grade, the kids, in the first few grades, the kids would visualize because the books had a lot of pictures in it, and the books were about things that they already had experience of, like a dog chasing a cat. Well, they have a dog, they have a cat maybe, and they, and they know what a dog looks like, smells like, feels like, probably even tastes like. And so when they say the word dog, they get all this subjective experience. They hit the fourth grade, and they want to learn about constitution. They don't have any subjective experience of the word constitution. So when they go through there and read it, they know how to enunciate it. But when they enunciate it, nothing happens in here at the, at the visual level or feeling level or anything like that. So I had to create a, a vocabulary strategy, if you will, that would give them some subjective experience. So my vocabulary strategy, which is in the book, um, says when you read the definition, a new definition, you read it and then what would that look like? What, what is the meaning of that? What would the meaning of that definition look like in your mind? And then they come up with a picture of it, and then they put the word that they are defining in that picture. And then they say the word, and then they describe the picture. They don't put any more words in there. They describe what does that look like. And what that does when they say the word and they describe it while they're looking at the picture, that hooks the sound of the word to the mean, a, a visual representation of the meaning of the word. So that later on when they're reading, as they're sounding the words out, pictures are popping into their head. 
Okay? And that's what I want to happen to those pictures. They can have feelings about it too if they want to. But that's getting real precise about what has to happen in the mind in order for reading comprehension to occur. I mean, that, that, that if there's anything that I think I have added to the, the world, it's that I, I found this void here and then used NLP to come up with what I consider to be world-class learning strategies um, that just work really, really well and they're really neat and the kids like them and stuff like this, and, but it does primarily require them to be visual. Because if I'm gonna take on the responsibility of teaching kids how to learn in the classroom, I do not want to teach them strategies that don't work very well. I want to teach them strategies that are world class that will help them um, not only survive but thrive. And visual learning is what works, what works really well. If I get somebody that's highly kinesthetic or highly auditory, then I just back off and I may do a lot of tapping on that stuff, you know, whatever is there, the issues that are there behind that, but I will teach them how to visualize. I have not found anybody yet that I have not been able to teach how to visualize. And once they learn how to visualize, then they, they can, um, you know, as they practice these strategies, these visual strategies become the new strategies. And it becomes a habit, becomes the new neurological programs that they operate out of. Yes? Don, in addition to academic deficits, when I'm talking to a teacher or a parent, I'm also hearing poor social skills. And these, uh, this uh, shows up often outside of the classroom, on the playground, or on the ball field, away from school. Do you have any other comments about that, please? Yeah. Um, once, I, once I have recognized that with somebody with ADD that I have to basically work at all levels with this. Um, the social skills, the behaviors, I mean, they, they turn their friends off and, you know, they come across as weird to their friends. And the, the, the place that I enter when I'm, when I'm working with somebody that has ADD symptom is at the capability level. First thing I want to know is, can they control their mind? Can they control those pictures in there or not? If they can control those pictures, then they don't have what I consider to be ADD. They may have some ADD symptoms that come out of stress and anxiety, but they don't have ADD because they can control their mind. If they can, if they can control their pictures, then I can immediately go to teach them how to learn and then teach them how to value learning and just move and change beliefs and all sorts of things. If they can't control the pictures in their mind, then I, I back off and I teach them how to control their mind. And if they have a... If they, can't, if they can't control their mind, most of them have a tremendous amount of anxiety about that. Uh, some of them are terrified. Some of them feel overwhelmed. Overwhelmed is just a real good feeling because those pictures are moving so fast that they can't, they can't keep up with them. You can tap on all those things, clear that stuff out, give them a break, and then, and, and then you teach them how to control the mind. You can, um, a lot of times, if you will clear out the, what I call the emotional baggage about that, a lot of times everything will slow down because it's the stress and anxiety that's been driving it that comes out of the fact that, you know, they haven't been able to do it before. If that still doesn't, um, if, if that still doesn't clear it out, then I start looking for issues or I start looking for maybe an imprint experience. I'll give you an example of one. I had this 75-year-old uh, woman that kept coming to my classes and she said, I can't make pictures. You talk about making pictures, I can't make pictures and, and I, want to, um, I want to start a new career. And I want a 10-year plan. I want to be able to see it vividly so I can go get it. And I did some of the standard stuff with her, and nothing worked. And um, <clears throat> I had some NLP trainers that came in and worked with her. Nothing worked. We couldn't get her to, to have images. And then um, one, of, one of my students was working with her, and he decided to go back and see if he could find an imprint. And so he did an age regression. And, you know, it's, and the deal is I want you to, and we do a lot of physical stuff. We'll have a walk a timeline. So we lay out a timeline on the floor, and then you get into the fact that I can't, I can't see, I can't see, I can't see, and you start walking back through your line, and you get to the point that, yeah, I can make pictures. And then you want to know, well, what happened right here that caused the shift, and that's your imprint. That's the issue that you need to tap on or work on. At that time, I wasn't into tapping, so we did standard NLP. What we found or what my student found was that when she was a little girl, eight years old, in one month, she had um, three major women figures in her life die. It's bang, bang, bang. One of them was a favorite grandmother of hers. Another one was a favorite aunt, and I can't remember what the other one was. When her grandmother <clears throat> was about to um, 
uh, to have the funeral for the grandmother. She was at the house before they left for the funeral home. And she heard our mother say, and this is the power of the unconscious mind. She heard our mother say, whatever we do, we can't let little Sally see them put granny in the ground. And she shut down her picture making just immediately. Once we recognized that imprint experience, we could go in and do what we call an imprinting, a re-imprinting on it, and all of a sudden she's able to visualize. And that's just an example of a, of a way to say, you know, she's, she's, she's got a belief up there because imprints will generate beliefs. And if we can find out what that precise thing is and go in and deal with that, then a lot of times, like somebody was saying, once we change something up here, everything else falls out. Does that make sense? Any other? Surely, we're out of questions. I have one, one, one little um, gift I want to give you all as far as something that y'all can do with your, your your people when you when you're about you say okay I think we've about done everything. I want to show you a way to use the logical levels to integrate everything that you've done through the logical levels. It's just really a magnificent transforming um, event that you can do with them. So she was first when, back there. When I work with uh, ADD and ADHD and learning disabilities. What I found is working with the parent at the same time is really important. Giving the parent some strategies to be able to take back to the teacher and uh, giving the student power in later years to take responsibility for his own learning mm -hmm. I think is very important and having that inner sense of power which everything you're saying is what you're giving them. You're, you're taking the powerlessness away. I want to add one comment to that, that I have an adult client, ADD, a, a genius in programming with a lot of things in the field coming at him because he's so good at what he does. And he shut down because it was coming too fast and his way of shutting down was to curl up in the basement in major depression. Yeah. And so we, there is a lot to do in this, and your, your strategy is perfect, and it does work. I mean, I, I will attest to that. I've been on your website. I've been using a lot of this, and it, it's beautiful. It works, and it flows. And kids immediately start to feel, feel their power in first or second session, and there's a light that comes on. Thank you. Well, you see if you can surpass that. I just have a quick question in terms of I work in the school system and in our district there are many children who are very impoverished uh, also bilingual is a major issue so would you just sort of address uh, have you used this with um, bilingual children economic level and um, intellectual level Intellectual level? Meaning, have you used it with retarded children, lower level children? Because we work with all levels. I have used it with retarded children. I've used it with um, uh, students that have been, um, had severe head trauma. Um, I, I don't, one of the limitations of what I do is that, that I don't have an opportunity to work with kids that are impoverished because I, I need to make a living and they can't pay me, and I haven't figured a way to give it away, although Gary came up with some good ideas this morning. Um, so I charge for what I do. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have a heck of a lot to say about that, and that's just one of the limitations of my experience is that I have not had that. Um, I'm in the process of training joy trainers. I have a 14-day you know, certification program every summer in, in training people on what I do. And... Um, People come in from all over the world to take this, and so I'm trying to put out, you know, those what George Bush called those those points of light, points of light that are out there in the world. And um, see, I think you guys will add to that because this tidal wave that I think you guys will do will just be really significant. Uh, let me say one one more thing that that I just think is a is a wonderful thing that you guys can add to your repertoire. Uh, once you've you know cleared everybody, once you've taught them how to learn, what you whenever you've done what you what you do. Um, what I do is I will have six pieces of paper, and I'll have a piece of paper that may have spiritual greater system written on it. Another one has identity written on it, et cetera. And I'll lay those out on the floor. And then let, I'll, I'll you know, I have to do a lot of explaining to the kids about how this works, but that's okay because I just get to work on their mind a little bit more with my language. 
um, but I'll be have them standing in the environment level. And let's let's suppose that somebody um, now is saying, "Well, I want to be all that I could be," and maybe that's a major belief that we've we've got to up here. Uh, so I have them step into the environment level, and I say, "Okay, Johnny. So, as a person that wants to be all they can be, where, when, and with whom will you be all that you can be?" And I I get them physiologically into it. I want them to gesture. I want them to go rah rah and all this. And they'll generally say something, well, in the classroom and at home with my parents and with my friends, I'm going to teach my friends all these learning strategies. And, you know, they, they just, I, do, I want them to just, just let it come out because that's, 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 um, that's, that's getting into their neurology, and that's what I'm wanting. This is an integration exercise. Then I step them into the, uh, the, and the behavior level and say, in order to be this, all, the, all that you can be, what behaviors will you engage in back in the school and back with uh, your parents and with your peers? And just let them elaborate. Then move them up the capability level to be all that you can be. You know, what, what mental strategies are you going to use? What uh, cognitive ways? How are you going to think? What are you going to do with your mind so that you can do these behaviors in this environment? And let them elaborate. Remind them that you've taught them how to learn and remind them that they now know how to learn. Remind them that they don't have any stuck state, states, if you will. Then move them up into values and beliefs. As a person that wants to be all they can be, what, what now do you value? What do you value differently? What do you believe differently? What would it be good for you to value? What would it be good for you to, to believe that's different? What, what beliefs can you obtain that will help you be all that you can be so that you can use these mental capabilities and do these behaviors in this environment? Then you move them up to the identity level and go, what kind of person are you? that would value this way, that would have these capabilities, do these behaviors in this environment. You know, what kind of person does that? And, and then move them up to the spiritual greater system. Who else is this going to serve that you would be this? And I like them to go metaphorical here if they can. You know, what, what is the greater vision that you have that being all that you can be is going to serve? And they elaborate on that. Then I turn them around, and maybe they want to serve the world. Now they started off real, you know, down there, there was real nitty-gritty, now they're global. In order to serve the world and, and to serve the people of the world, you know, what kind of person will you need to be to serve the world? What beliefs and values do you need and do you have that will help you serve the world and make the world a better place, which is mine? You know, what capabilities do you need or do you have that you can bring to bear so that you can serve the world? And again, I'm, I'm, I do this and then I just let them talk because I want it to come out of them. Go to the behavior level. What behaviors would you, will you engage in now to serve the world, to make it a better place? And where will you do this? And again, let them elaborate. What that does is integrate everything that you've done through the whole physiologically, neurologically, mentally, emotionally, through all the logical levels. There's nothing, there, you don't leave any gaps there. You don't, you don't hope they go home and come up with this realization. You're helping them get it right there. And sometimes I have to make suggestions to them, make suggestions to them. I don't tell them. I say, well, you know, you know, you could be this kind of person, and if they like it, then they grab it. If they don't, they, you know, they turn it away. Does that make sense? I just thank you guys so much. I've, it's been an honor to be here. Thank you.